Well, all right, it is four o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, well, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Museum of the United States Army and Civil War Week. We're on our fourth day of Civil War Week. We're going strong, and we're pleased to present to you another program uh, using the lessons of the Civil War in the classroom, uh, presented by museum educator Jennifer Dubina. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few moments, uh, but in the meantime, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping options, uh, just a few housekeeping notes, I should say. Uh, please note that all participants and cameras, uh, microphones and cameras are turned off. Um, and if we would actually ask that if you want to interact with our educator, you may use that in the uh, chat box. Please use the chat box to answer any questions as uh, Jennifer is going along. Uh, but for any questions that you'd like a uh, answered at the end of the program, please use the Q&A tab. And if we have time at the end of the program, uh, our presenter will get to those questions then. So, all right, well, at that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jennifer Dubina for this excellent program. Right, take it away, Jen. Great, thank you, AJ, for that wonderful introduction. And welcome everybody to the Educator Workshop using the lessons of Civil War leadership in the classroom. It is so great to see so many of you again, because it looks like almost everyone who's attending has taken part in Civil War Week already. So it's so great to hear. Uh, it's really a ringing endorsement, I guess, for our program that you keep coming back every night. We really appreciate it. Uh, before we do get started with our program, I wanted to know a little bit more about you um, to see who is in the audience tonight. If you are currently an educator or maybe a lifelong learner or even a student. So I have put a poll on the screen. If you could take a minute to answer that um, and I'll go over a few housekeeping notes that AJ went over, but I'm going to quickly do it just in case anyone missed it. Um, we are using the webinar feature of Zoom, so your cameras are turned off and your microphones are muted, so I can't see you and I can't hear you. So if you do have a question for me, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And during the program, I will be asking the group for feedback, and I would love to hear um, your thoughts. Um, and see how you're using um, civil war leadership in the classroom or if you plan to. So please feel free to use the chat to communicate with me when I'm asking questions, but also to communicate amongst each other. And it looks like some poll answers are just coming in and it looks like we have a really great mix of um, participants. And let me share the results with you. It looks like the majority of the group, you are lifelong learners. I do recognize some museum docents in this group, so it's great to see you all here. Um, and then it looks like we have educators from high school and from the middle school age group, and we even have two students. So thank you so much for joining us today, especially at, depending where you are, um, the end of a long work or school day. I'm gonna stop sharing the results. And get started. So before we get into the meat of the program, I just want to talk a little bit about the National Army Museum that's located in Fort Belvoir. The museum opened to the public in November of 2020, and our mission is to tell the history of America's oldest military service, the United States Army. And the museum's exhibitions and programs tell the Army's history through the stories um, and the Army's history and traditions through the lens of the American soldier. And so the museum is closed to the public right now as a public health uh, precaution due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we have created a number of ways for you to engage with the museum virtually by hosting programs like this one um, and Civil War Week and also creating digital content that's available on the museum's website. And so I encourage you to follow us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, or Instagram, um, using the handle at US Army, or um, to look at our website. And since you all are on your computers now, you can bookmark it, bookmark the event page, because we have lots of great events coming up um, that extend beyond Civil War Week, and we are always adding new things. And I have the website up on the screen, too, if you're not um, you don't already know it. 
But today what we are going to be doing is talking about some of the digital resources that are available on the museum's website that are related to the Civil War. And my goal today is to show you how they can be used with your students to talk about Civil War leadership and how they might be incorporated into your curriculum. And our website has a number of different resources that you can use, and they're located in our digital resources section, but they're also located in the exhibits tab as well. Um, so on your screen, I did take a snapshot of our digital resources page, but I encourage you again um, to even do it now during the program. You can go onto our website and look through all the different things that you can use in your classroom. Just a few of them are articles, biographies, artifact spotlights, um, we have a video series called Curator's Corner, and all of this material can be used in your classroom, but it can also be used by anyone who wants to learn more about a topic. Um, and it can be used to talk to your children or your grandchildren, or say if you're a volunteer in the museum, um, can be used when you're talking with visitors about the museum's content. So today, as many of you or all of you know, we are on day four of Civil War Week. And the theme of the museum's Civil War Week is leadership. And all of the history talks that you've attended, the battle briefs, the field trip um, that we've hosted so far this week have all focused on different aspects of army leadership. And it's really focused on leadership of different individuals. So we've looked at Meade, Grant, Lee, Jackson. Tonight we'll look at Burnside, um, but we've also looked at the individual soldier more indirectly through the virtual field trip, um, looking at how soldiers, the things soldiers carried into battle um, to accomplish their mission. But today what I wanted to do was talk about leadership more broadly. Um, leadership isn't unique to the Army. Um, leadership is something that we see every day in our lives. Um, it's something that we work with our students, with our children. It's something that we work on with ourselves to improve our leadership skills and our abilities. Um, and leadership is essential to the US Army. And it can be seen through the ranks of seasoned officers to newly listed soldiers. Um, Army leaders, really their job is to inspire others to complete their missions and to make sure that the Army is prepared to accomplish any task that the nation requires. And soldiers exemplify that leadership through their characteristics, their skills, and their actions on and off the battlefield. Um, but as I said before, it's not just Army leaders and soldiers who use leadership, right? Leadership is something that we are constantly developing and it's really important in children, whether we are a teacher or a parent or any type of caregiver. Um, leadership is something that we focus on in the classroom and in children because good leadership skills can instill confidence. They help children solve problems to think more creatively, work in teams, work more collaboratively with others, all skills that are important, not only in the classroom, but later in life and are skills that we can constantly be learning even as lifelong learners now. So today, while the focus of this workshop is the Civil War and more um, has a historical focus, the key takeaways are really focused more on leadership and thinking about what makes a leader, what qualities and skills stand out from leaders of the past, and how do we recognize those attributes and then thinking about what leadership means today um, while thinking about leadership of the past. All right, so let's get started with um, the presentation really. What I'm going to do today is I am going to walk you through what is a small portion of a larger lesson plan that you could use in the future to discuss Civil War leadership or leadership in general. And I hope this gives you an idea about how you might use our digital resources to fit in your curriculum. And so I'm calling this a mini lesson, but it's really just a few separate activities that can be used together or can be used separately to best fit your needs. Um, you can keep adding on to it with more artifacts or more primary resources, or you can take just whatever part that you need because however you're using it, your audience is unique um, and you should be able to kind of massage it and use it how you would want it um, in your classroom or at home. All right, so 
you're now taking on the role of my student as I am talking to you and walking you through these activities. So the first thing I want to do is find out what does leadership mean to you? So using the chat, please take a minute and I would like you to give me one or two words that you associate with a leader. What are the first few characteristics that come to mind? I don't need a full definition, but a few words would be great. Honesty, that's a great one. Responsibility, integrity, ooh, guider, I really like that one. Um, accountability, ooh, compassion, inspiring, strength, ooh, decisiveness, courage, moral courage. I like that added, um, added addition. A listener, someone's character, charismatic, oh, caring a role model, ethical, oh, someone who's positive, that's one of my favorite characteristics, influential, understanding, uh, the ability to motivate others, ooh, and integrity. Wow. Oh, a mentor. These is an impressive list of um, attributes. It's really very quite impressive list. And as we're reading through these, um, these words, as I'm reading them out loud, I hear that they fall into really two kind of different categories. You have these attributes, which is the personal characteristics that people have. They have integrity, their understanding, but then you have these skills, um, like Charles said, the ability to motivate others. Um, they're really kind of fall in the two categories of the leadership. You've got your skills on one hand, but you also have these personal attributes. And this makes me think of in the army, when we talk about leadership, the army uses something called the leadership requirements model to define the attributes and core competencies of leadership. And essentially what that model is, is it just says that leadership combines an individual's character with their intellect and their actions. So it's what they are, it's what they know, and it's what they do. And all of these things together are the hallmark of a great leader. And what strikes me as I'm reading through this list is the list and the words that you gave me are many of the same words that you see in this Army Leadership Requirements Model that I put on um, the screen today. So it shows here that the idea of leadership, again, it's not unique to the Army, and many of these leadership ideas carry over into our life today, into civilian life. And so now what I would like you to do is to remember those characteristics, those core competencies that we've just identified and that I just laid out, and maybe even the ones that you see on the screen. And keep those words in mind as we go through the rest of the lesson, because we are going to come back to this at the end. Now, if this is an in-person class, we would probably be at tables and I'd be making you write these down on chart paper and coming up with a definition of leadership and having you share aloud. Um, but for the purposes of Zoom and for time, we are just gonna think about it in our own heads, these words, and think about that definition of leadership and keep it at the forefront of your mind. All right, so now that we've talked about what makes a good leader, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. And we're going to look at an artifact that's on display in our Preserving the Nation Gallery. And I'm going to talk you through a guided looking exercise to demonstrate how a museum artifact can be used to talk about leadership. So the exercise we're doing, I call it a guided looking exercise, but I've seen it called slow looking or even quiet study. Some people might call it a visual thinking strategy. And it's something that's really used in art museums to talk about art. Um, but what I think makes a guided looking strategy really great, even when a history museum, is it's a method of taking time to really look at the artifact that's on display um, and really engage with the viewer or your students so they can see what's there. And the goal is to make a more meaningful and personal connection to the artifact by taking the time to study and think about it more deeply. Now, for a lot of people, and I will admit, even for myself, this is not something that comes naturally to me. And I think it works best when you have someone who is guiding you through the process. So I am going to guide you all through the process of a guided looking activity by looking at this artifact. 
And so on your screen is an image of an object on display in the museum. It's in the Preserving Our Nation Gallery, which covers the Civil War. And I want you to look very closely at this artifact. And I know by looking at some of the attendees here, we do have some museum docents and volunteers who probably know exactly what this artifact is. But I want you to take that from your mind, remove any preconceived notions that you have about this artifact and just focus on what you see in the picture. And the longer that you're looking at this, the more you can see. And so the first step in a guided looking um, exercise is to really think about and describe the object. So as you're looking closely, I'm going to ask you a few rhetorical questions to help you think about what you're seeing. So what is the size and shape of this artifact? What colors do you see? Are there any identifiable shapes that stand out to you? Can you tell what materials this is made from? And do you notice any textures? Is it used or worn? Is there anything missing? All right. So now I've got you thinking about the object itself and what it looks like. And I'll say that for me, when I take a step back and I look at this artifact, I start to see things I didn't really notice before, um, particularly with the texture. Um, I can almost feel it now when I look at it. I can see um, and like almost feel, to me, it looks like it might be a little bit rough. I can start to see the shapes of the stars kind of popping out in a way that I might not have noticed before. Um, so that just helps you start feeling the object, making a little bit more closer connection to it. So the second step in a guided activity is to now start thinking about that artifact. So as you're looking at it, what do you think the artifact is? And what do you think it might've been used for? Would it have been used by itself? And what do you think the designs or decorations represent? And is this something that might still be used today? All right, so now that we're thinking about the artifact, we're looking at it, we're thinking about how it was used and what it looks like. I wanna add another layer on to this visual thinking strategy or this guided looking activity and start putting the artifact into context. So the artifact that you were looking at on your screen is what remains of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry National Color. And many of you may have heard of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, perhaps if you've seen the movie Glory. Um, but this flag was the national color that the 54th carried with them. And so when the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on July 1, 1863, it opened the door for the enlistment of black soldiers due to a provision that read, such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed services of the United States. And about approximately 180,000 former slaves and free blacks served in what came to be known as the United States Colored Troops. The 54th Massachusetts was one of these units, and they were one of three that were raised um, from the state of Massachusetts. And the 54th is probably best known for its service in leading an assault on Battery Wagner on Morris Island. And it was one of the first major actions in which African American soldiers fought for the Union in the Civil War. And the image that you see on your screen is actually a recreation depiction of that. Um, on the evening of July 18th, 5,000 US Army soldiers began marching in the darkness towards Battery Wagner. Of those soldiers were the 54th Massachusetts who were ready to demonstrate their bravery and military bearing. They pushed on until coming within 100 yards of the Confederate line at which point the order was given to charge. Almost immediately, 
Southern guns opened fire, tearing through the Union rank and with a devastating effect. Um, the men of the 54th Massachusetts continued to fight even amid heavy casualties and charge. They suffered over 42% um, of their unit, 42% casualties. Um, and over, with of their 600 men, over 280 were killed, wounded, captured, missing, or presumed dead. Um, so the fragment that you've seen was the national color that would have been carried into battle um, at Fort Wagner and at other um, battles that the 54th participated in. And if you aren't interested, if you don't know what a national color is, it is one of the two flags that would have been carried by Civil War Regiment Union. So this brings us back to step four in the guided looking process. So you described the artifact, you talked about what the artifact might be used for. We added in that historical context, and now we're going to a fourth step, which is bringing in a personal meaning and reflection. So taking into account the historical context that surrounds this artifact, what does this artifact mean to you? And what do you think this artifact means to others? And what does this artifact tell you about leadership? Now, one leadership component that comes to mind for me when I am looking at this artifact and thinking about um, the efforts of the 54th Massachusetts is duty and thinking about filling your obligations and doing your best. Really, duty extends beyond kind of laws and regulations and orders. It's really a commitment to doing what is best, even when things are difficult. And so in this case, um, it almost becomes more prominent when you take into account the historical context of the artifact, and then also the artifact itself, because you get the dual fight that these soldiers were fighting for and understanding. They were fighting against slavery in the South, but also for equity um, and inclusion and that they were willing to risk their lives. And so exactly as someone has just said in the um, chat is when you look at the artifact itself and you start to see that where um, and how well, um, well used it is, you kind of start to get that more personal meaning, the understanding that this artifact really meant something to someone. And by asking students to really think about all the ways it was used, how it was worn, what it could have meant to people, you start to get that dual meaning. And you start to understand that personal meanings and communal messages can be attached to artifacts and objects. So in that case, this color becomes a symbol of pride, a source of morale, but it also takes on really a deeper meaning. It takes on one of freedom. So that is an example of going through one of our artifacts um, on our website. And it can be used in doing artifacts, not only that are spotlighted on the website, but also artifacts that are in our museum as well. Um, in addition to looking at artifacts, soldier stories um, in the form of profiles and biographies are other resources that are available on the museum's website. And these personal experiences of soldiers can provide more insight into what skills and characteristics shape a leader. And they're another tool that you could use in your curriculum. And I want it to stay on the topic of the 54th Massachusetts. And I want to highlight one soldier in particular, and that is Sergeant William H. Carney. Sergeant Carney served with the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. And when asked what uh, made him enlist, Carney stated, when the country called for all persons, I gave my, I could best serve my God by serving my country and my brothers. And Carney is probably best known in history for his actions at the Battle of Fort Wagner on July 18th. Uh, during the battle, Carney was severely injured yet still managed to save the American flag after previous color bearers fell. Carney said, I threw away my gun, seized the colors, and made my way to the head of the column, proclaiming, I did my duty, the dear old flag never touched the ground. 
Now, while I can tell you what happens and I can quickly read off a very well-known quote by Kearney, I wanted Sergeant Kearney to tell you about his experiences in his own words. Um, so right now we are going to listen as a group and you can also read along on your screen to Sergeant Kearney's own recollections of the events that transpired that day. So I'm going to read you actually a small snippet of a much longer um, description of what happened. We were all ready for the charge and the regiment started to its feet. The charge being fairly commenced, we had got but a short distance when we were opened upon musketry, shell, grape shot, and canister, which mowed down our men right and left. As the color bearer became disabled, I threw away my gun and seized the colors, making my way to the head of the column. In less than 20 minutes, I found myself alone, struggling upon the ramparts, while dead and wounded were all around me, lying one upon another. Here, I said, I cannot go into the battery alone. And so I halted and knelt down, holding the flag in my hand. While there, the musket balls and grape shot were flying all around me. And as they struck, the, and as they struck, the sand would blow up in my would blow in my face. So this is just a very short um, excerpt from a much longer um, description that Sergeant Kearney had of his experiences at Fort Wagner. And I did uh, zoom out. I did put the citation if you would like to see it. Um, it comes the original citation comes from the history of New Bedford and its vicinity, and it's available on Google Books um, on page 348. Um, and this is Carney's own words about what happened, and it's actually much longer. Um, and while this is a primary source, Carney's own words, he's recounting what he said, and it doesn't necessarily visual, like the national color fragment, a similar technique can be used to reflect on Carney's recollection, um, especially when discussing primary sources with your students. So what would that look like using a guided listening um, activity on a primary source. So after reading through this description of what happened, the first thing to start asking your students or whoever um, that you've just read this to is to describe what happened. Who is the speaker? Who is performing the action in this account? What is the speaker or writer describing? How does the speaker or writer know what happened? So that starts getting you into that who, that what, that why that's happening in your primary source. The next part is to really start getting students to start thinking about the primary source itself, right? Because like everything, there's bias in all types of sources. So thinking about when was the source written? Uh, this was written in 1892. Um, 1892, um, what is the writer's relationship to the action being described, right? In this case, this is Sergeant Kearney writing exactly what he remembers transpiring, although he is writing about it many years later. Um, and he's also writing about it for an author who's doing a history of his town, New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he's from. And so actually in the book, in this chapter, the author asks, um, asks Kearney, he says he wants to interview some of the famous residents of the town and says, many of you may be familiar with Carney. His story is so important, I cannot paraphrase it. And Carney submits this um, account to the author to be published. Um, so thinking about why it was written and then what might this document be used for? Um, why are people reading this book? Who's reading it? Is there an agenda behind it? And then after you start thinking about what actually happened in the primary source, thinking about um, what's beyond, this, what's behind the source that you can't actually see, then it's starting to think about a reflection um, to help bring that tying it more to um, get a personal meaning. So that would be reflection. And so based on Carney's actions, what leadership qualities do you identify here? And one of the leadership qualities that stands out to me really is one that was mentioned by quite a few people in at the beginning of our program, which is personal courage. 
And personal courage really isn't the absence of fear, it's putting fear aside to overcome adversity. And army leaders display and encourage uh, personal courage among their soldiers um, to complete their mission. And so um, that is just one example of what you could pull apart from leadership qualities from here. Um, as you heard this, did anyone think of any other leadership qualities that stood out in Carney's actions that day? I'll give you a second if you would like to put some into the chat. And what I like with these reflection questions is that they're very open-ended. Um, bravery is a good one. Thank you, Barbara. Um, it allows for students to put lots of different um, answers of what leadership qualities are um, because selfless service, that's great, and an army value. Um, thank you, Kelly. And it allows students to really, there is no wrong answer, right? Um, when we all said, what is a word that comes to mind for leadership? We all said something different. Um, there are very few um, words were repeated. And so leadership is one of those things that is it's sometimes a little bit more nebulous and hard to pin down. Um, but by using these accounts and using these artifacts, you can kind of get at that to find more meaning um, and allow students to think a little bit more critically, um, but also thinking critically in a more safer space because there is so many answers that can work. All right. So I did wanna show you where I got some of these resources from. Um, the ones that I used to talk through the leadership qualities of the 54th Massachusetts and Sergeant Kearney are available on our website. Uh, we have a biography of Sergeant Kearney, an article on the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, and the national color is actually shown on the exhibit tab of our website. Now, these are just two digital resources that I picked. Um, There's so many other examples. We have a list of biographies that you can pick from and soldier, um, soldier profiles in the exhibits tab and we highlight a number of different artifacts. Um, so you can talk about leadership, not only in the Civil War, but you could talk about leadership in World War I or World War II. Um, you can use them for all types of things. So you can re recreate what I just did with any of the artifacts or stories on display in the museum or on our website to talk about Civil War leadership or leadership more broadly. And actually, if you wanted to do a lesson plan, not on leadership, but on maybe teamwork or communication, or something like that, you can also use these same strategies. They work in many different ways. But to conclude my mini lesson on our leadership, uh, now that we've looked more closely at an artifact in the museum, uh, learned about the history of the 54th Massachusetts and heard Sergeant Kearney's feat of personal courage, um, I encourage you to answer some of these questions, which is um, what leadership qualities do you see in the Civil War as evidence through this lens that we looked at? And do you think those Civil War characteristics translate to leadership today? And has your leadership definition changed? Are there any other skills or characteristics that you might add to this definition now that we've looked um, a little more closely at the Civil War? So at the beginning of our program, I asked you to define leadership. And I said, don't forget the words that you used. Um, don't forget about that definition. Is there anything else that you might add based on what we've looked at so far today? All right, and I will leave that as more of an open-ended question for you to think on. <laughs> Quick study, oh, I love that. Duty over personal safety, oh, I really like that. Um, right, and so, so it's expanded some of your definitions. Um, 
and add it to it and that anyone can be a leader. Yes, Maria, I love that. Um, so that brings me to just showing you a tiny little part of the Civil War Leadership Lesson Plan um, that we developed for Civil War Week um, that's pulling together all of the resources on our website um, that can easily be broken into smaller activities and can be used for different a different Civil War lesson entirely. It could be something that you can use as just a short activity at the beginning of class or a short activity um, with a family member if you are visiting a museum. Um, one thing to think about is that over the past year, not many of us have had an opportunity to visit a museum to interact with primary sources in a way that we could have a year ago. And unless you're doing it every day, like someone who works in a museum um, or someone who's studying history closely or works with artifacts, it's something that some of us might be taking for granted. And looking at a historical artifact or looking at a primary source isn't something that comes naturally. And so using these types of strategies, especially for a younger audience who is really just starting to visit museums. And if they have been visiting them before the pandemic, it's been a year, a whole lifetime, right? Um, they're gonna need practice to getting back into doing those things. So a guided looking activity, whether it be by using a primary resource or using an artifact that you can see um, in person or one that you are looking at a picture of online is gonna help them start to think about those connections that they can be making um, once they are visiting museums again or actually being able to interact with primary sources more regularly. And so that concludes my formal um, presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Yes, absolutely, Jen. Thank you very, very much for that informative presentation. Uh, we did have a couple questions from the audience, but I'd like to remind the audience now, if you'd like to ask your question, go ahead and put it into the Q&A tab now and we'll get to it. Uh, but the first question we had, uh, Jen, was, can I use these techniques with my uh, children while visiting a museum? Absolutely. Uh, the great thing about these techniques is they can be used anywhere and they are, honestly, they're not unique to what is a traditional primary source right, or a traditional museum artifact. You can use it while looking at a landscape if you're visiting a national park. Um, you can use it while looking at a statue or a monument. Um, they really are universal. So they can be used really anywhere. And it is also probably a good, a good conversation starter or a way to start talking about a museum when you are going there. Um, so yeah, they're very universal and you can use it um, with anything. Oh, here's a fun one. Do you have a favorite artifact from the Civil War that you like to teach with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I will say the 54th is, uh, Massachusetts flag fragment is one of my favorite artifacts um, that is in the Preserving the Nation Gallery because it, um, as you're looking at it, it is just the meaning behind the flag, I think is so poignant. Um, and I just get such a connection to feeling um, empathy for the soldiers who fought with the 54th. And I think that it is just such a powerful artifact that talks not only about the army's history, but it goes even broader to talking about things like what does it mean to be a citizen? Um, what does it mean to be an American? So that is personally my favorite, which is why I picked it um, for here because it's easy to talk about, but there are so many great artifacts. My second favorite would be the Napoleon, um, the 12 pounder Napoleon that you can see on the screen right now, actually in the tableau. And I love that artifact because of how it's set in the tableau. Um, I think it's a really fun one for visitors because there's so much that they can look at and talk about things like teamwork of all of the different soldiers working together to make it work. Um, you can talk about the soldiers load too. Um, so those are some of my favorite artifacts. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a sucker for the Napoleon myself. <laughs> I had to put okay, it 
campaign. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, we do have another question here, if I can get it pulled. There we are. Um, so uh, this one comes from, I am a docent at the museum. Would these techniques be appropriate in my gallery talks? So this is a docent specific question. I love it, um, especially since I've worked with so many of you for docent training. Yes, absolutely. It could be um, used in a gallery talk. I actually think it would be a great conversation starter. Um, because if you are, it's a great way to start talking to visitors about um, an object that's on display, asking them what they see, asking them um, to really talk more about what they might think it would be used for. Because again, for people, and I would imagine that many of the people who are listening today like museums and like to visit them. And so we're used to visiting museums. We know what to expect. And when you walk into a room full of artifacts, you feel, it might feel like your home. Um, but for some people that might feel very overwhelming to walk in and the visual overload of things. Um, so helping a visitor really focus in on something and start to think about it can really take that overwhelming feeling out of visiting a museum and help them figure out where to look because it's an object, there's panels, the labels, and you don't know where you're going. So I think this is a good technique to break down um, how to look at an artwork or an artifact and it would work great in our exhibition, The Art of Soldiering. Yeah, I am you saying that, I almost feel my the gears turning in my brain about uh, how to use these things. So I think that's all the questions we had in the Q&A tab. So if there were no more, if there weren't any more questions, I think we can move to wrap up here. Um, so again, thank you everyone very much for attending. Um, if you would like, if you're interested in uh, finishing out Civil War Week with us, you know, we have a couple more very exciting events. Uh, tonight we have a book talk with Frank O'Reilly, and he's going to talk about the military career of Ambrose Burnside, uh, one of my favorite uh, leaders from the Civil War. So we're continuing with this theme of leadership. It's quite, I highly recommend that. I'll definitely be attending. And uh, we also actually have a gallery talk tomorrow from the Chief Curator of the National Museum in the United States Army. Paul Miranda, and he's actually going to be, uh, you know, uh, presenting on the uh, Civil War Gallery Preserving the Nation. So if you're interested, uh, please be sure to tune in. And, uh, oh, Jen, I think we might have had uh, another, I think actually that's about it. <laughs> I think that's about it. Yep. Okay. And Jen, did you have any other, um, any other lasting uh, words of wisdom for the audience before we go? Um, nothing to nothing different than what you said other than thank you so much everyone for coming and for attending at the end of what would probably be many of your work days or the end of your day um and if you're on the east coast on a beautiful day um when you could have been outside and i will say that these programs are recorded and will be on the museum's youtube channel um soon um so keep looking out for those, uh, make sure you bookmark the museum's webpage so you can always know uh, when our programs are coming and follow us on social media too. And that is all for me. <laughs> all right, well, I think that does it for us. Again, thank you much, uh, everyone for attending. Thank you all and have a great evening and see you tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs>